computer. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I have been asked to, to record it, so thank you. Uh, so welcome to the uh, European Butterflies Group AGM. Once again, we are having to do this uh, remotely rather than in person, which is disappointing. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Mike Prentice. I will present the chair's report shortly. Uh, then David Moore will give us an update on the financial position. David is our honorary treasurer. Um, we decided back at the end of November that we had to have the meeting uh, today and we had to do it um, virtually rather than in person. And that was just as the Omicron variant was starting. Um, we decided we couldn't risk a meeting in person. And I see that case rates are increasing again in the UK today. So perhaps we made the right decision. But I do hope that our next one, whether it's in the autumn of this year or in the spring of next year, we will be able to do in person. I know that from my point of view, I much enjoy the bits before and after the AGM when we have the opportunity to talk and swap experiences and uh, exchange information. So hopefully we will be able to do that again for our next meeting. Um, we have a number of uh, committee uh, members present, uh, Dudley Cheeseman, Jude Locke, Roger Gibbons, Martin Davis, Marion Thomas, David Moore, I think Mike Williams, oh no, Mike, that isn't Mike Williams, sorry, that's Nick Williams. Nick. Um, uh, present. We also have apologies from Simon and Anne Spencer, who are in Portugal. Dave Plowman, who unfortunately has COVID. And we have apologies from Keith and Walter Winton, who are looking for butterflies in, in uh, Cyprus. Uh, I should have also mentioned but Nigel. Nigel Peace is on the um, uh, on the call too in Tenerife. Um, last year the meeting was very short. We just uh, did the necessary formal business, reported on the branch activities and finances. But this year, I'm very pleased to say that after the formal part, Sam Ellis is going to give us a talk. Uh, Sam is Butterfly Conservation's International Director. He's also Chair of Butterfly Conservation Europe. And his talk will be promoting international butterfly conservation action. So we'll look forward to that. Um, after uh, my Chair's report and David's report, we will consider the re-election of committee members whose terms have expired following which there may be time for questions, and then Sam will give his talk. The minutes of the last AGM, were, which was held on the 10th of April, uh, 2021, were posted on the website, and I propose to take those minutes as read. Um, Martin Davis has proposed that they are accepted. Could I have a seconder, please, to that? I think yes, I put his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. So thank you. So can I ask all those who's who are in favour and who've got their cameras on to raise yeah. their hands? Yeah, in favour. Thank you very much. Uh, so the minutes of this AGM will also appear shortly on the website, though um, I think uh, Mike Haig, who... Um, manages the uh, the website is going to be away for um, a few weeks so it may not be until the end of April that they're on there but they will be there and whilst mentioning the website I'd just like to thank both Jude uh, Jude Locke who's on the call who manages the content and Mike Haig who is the uh, technical wizard I'd like to thank both of them for all the work they do on the website and I'll come back to the website again in a second when I get on to my chair's report. So 
my uh, chairman's report. Uh, last year at the AGM, I started by saying that 2020 had been a difficult year. Well, I don't think 2021 was any easier. Once again, our membership and our subscription income were pretty much unaffected, but all of our planned and proposed activities had to be cancelled yet again. Our membership stands at around 700. We've had a long-standing wish to be able to offer overseas membership uh, and an agreement from uh, Butterfly Conservation Head Office that we are able to do so. Unfortunately, with the impact of the pandemic, we weren't able or the head office was not able to organize this, but I believe that the way is now clear for us to do so. And we're talking about that from perhaps the end of April, we will be able to offer overseas membership to those who are not members of Butterfly Conservation, but uh, living abroad. So this would give us the ability to um, uh, liaise better with uh, European butterfly enthusiasts and hopefully carry out more conservation work. Uh, as I said earlier, we had to postpone all of our activities in 2021. We were due to um, visit Northern Spain for the third survey of Euchloe Bazai, which is um, Spanish greenish black tip. And we had planned surveys for uh, Pseudocazara arestes, which is the um, Dills grayling, and further work on Coleus myrmidoni, uh, Danube clouded yellow in Romania. All of these activities were postponed in 2020 and in 2021. Uh, I reported last year that we had offered a research bursary to Juan Pablo Cancela, uh, a Spanish postgraduate student from the, although he's Spanish, he's at the University of the Azores. Um, Juan Pablo's field work was interrupted by the pandemic, but he did manage to complete the field work in 2021, and his report is available on the website. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting piece of work. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the work that Jude Locke and Mike Haig do on the website, and I would encourage you to keep looking at it because it's constantly changing. Some of the information you'll find there, which has been put on in the last period, is that uh, Bill Raymond, with the assistance of Roger Gibbons, completed his guide to the um, Pergus group of grizzled skippers. Uh, should be a great help if you're sitting there puzzling in the field somewhere, wondering what skipper this is. Um, you'll also find there all of the uh, copies of all of the newsletters, except the most recent. And uh, here I should thank Nigel Peace uh, for his hard work and creativity in editing the newsletter. So thank you, Nigel. And um, there's also on, the, uh, on there, an index of newsletters. So if you're looking for information from past newsletters, whether you're looking for information about a particular species or a particular area or region, which is featured in an article, you should be able to track it down. And that was work done by Graham Revel. So uh, although he's not on the call, I thank him nonetheless. So the website is under constant uh, review. In the last week alone, you can see that uh, Jude has uh, posted details of an upcoming talk by uh, Professor Robert Wilson. This is one of a series of talks that Butterfly Conservation Europe are organizing. Um, that's on the 23rd of March. Uh, Jude has also posted on the website, the, a copy of a poster that um, Constanti Stefanescu has just produced uh, together with his uh, colleagues at the University of Grenoble. Um, it's a beautiful poster about the um, 
migration of the uh, painted lady. And although it's intended really for general public consumption, it's, uh, it's a beautiful piece of work and well worth looking at. Um, once again, we have run a uh, very successful photographic competition. Uh, I mentioned this in particular to ensure that uh, uh, Jean Cheeseman can, uh, can do one up on uh, Dudley because she got her one of her photographs on the uh, on the calendar this year. No, but uh, but seriously, uh, I'd like to record my thanks to Anne Spencer and to the judges. Uh, it's a it's a fantastic piece of work once again. I think we sold 150 calendars, um, including 50 which went to Lars Pedersen in uh, Sweden. He's always been a, somebody who's bought a number uh, of calendars. Um, I think he gives them to his transect walkers as a gift. So uh, we're grateful to Lars as well. As ever, the standard of photographs is amazing. Um, so thanks to all those who submitted, thanks to the judges and uh, congratulations to those whose photographs appeared on the calendar. Um, as an organisation, we continue to work closely with Butterfly Conservation Europe. Now, they've completed their ABLE project, which you may know about, ABLE standing for Assessing Butterflies in Europe. Um, they're now working on SPRING. They managed to get these uh, great acronyms. Um, uh, SPRING is... Um, so I'm just letting somebody else in. Um, Spring is a pollinator initiative. I think Sam may say something about uh, Spring in his talk. Um, ABEL was a two year project, which was encouraging butterfly monitoring across Europe. And um, it sort of kickstarted various new um, butterfly monitoring projects as well as supporting some of the long established schemes. As part of the ABLE project, they produced a number of field guides to the butterflies of various areas. And these are available on our website and the Butterfly Conservation uh, Europe website. For example, there were four different field guides produced for various, er various areas of um, Italy one for Andalusia, one for Cyprus, one for Slovenia. So um, they're well worth uh, looking at um, on our website or Butterfly Conservation Europe. Um, as I said, we work closely with them. Um, I'm an advisor to the uh, Butterfly Conservation Europe board and that has its advantages since, um, again, a project that Sam will mention is um, on the endemic butterflies of Madeira. And all of the board members and advisors were asked to help with a project on Madeira. So Sam and I did have a week uh, in October, walking a number of predefined routes using the 15 minute count app that um, uh, butterfly count app, which uh, is a fantastic, uh, piece of work and uh, I think Sam will talk about that I'm sure. Um, so you'll, uh, Sam and I had a great week there, you'll be able to find an account for that in the next newsletter. So planned or proposed activities for 2022 are, well I, I touch wood uh, at this point because let's hope that travel is going to be easier. Uh, we're going to do a further survey on Euchloe Bazai Iberi, the um, northern population of Spanish Greenish Black Tip. We hope that we will be able to do uh, trips to Romania for both broods of Colleus Myrmidoni, the Danube Clouded Yellow. We are hoping that we will get some maps from Jacqueline Luce and Matthias Dolek, who have um, prepared some maps of where it may be possible to find further populations of the butterfly. 
and perhaps um, some work on looking for uh, Shuja Kazawa uh, Orestes, Dill's Grayling in uh, Northern Greece. So that's the end of um, the chair's report. And I think I will now ask, I'll mute myself and ask David Moore to give us a, an update on the uh, financial situation. Thank you, Mike. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, right. Okay, excellent. That means I've switched my microphone on. Um, I sent an email to everyone this morning. I know it was rather late in the day, just to give you an update visually. And I have that in front of me right now. And the truth of the matter, there, is, there isn't a great deal that's happened due to the situation really with um, COVID. The only uh, expenses that have gone out for grants, in fact, have been the sponsorship of that Pyrenees guide, the one I think Jude was involved with. Um, they, BC, have, have put the entire 500 for Juan Pablo Cancela in last year's, even though they didn't pay all of it until I think it was April or May of this year anyway. Um, we are £1,900 greater in terms of what is in our bank account at the moment than we were at the beginning of the year. Uh, so again, we've, we've had difficulty getting rid of money because everything's just seized up. Uh, and of course, we've no AGM expenses, that's a considerable amount budgeted for £700 this year. So until we get moving again, uh, I don't expect that to change much. Hopefully, as Mike said, there'll be initiatives uh, this year and next year. So uh, it's, it's a pretty healthy financial situation, not a healthy situation from the perspective of what we'd all like to do. Um, but things do seem to be improving. There are quite a few countries now where you, you don't even need your uh, passenger locator certificates anymore. So with any luck, this latest Omicron B2, whatever they're calling it, won't impact us too widely. And fingers crossed, we can hope to get back to normal at some point during the year. Uh, I've still got an issue, an outstanding issue from last year regarding our subscriptions, which don't seem to be getting up to our budget of 5,000, with two months still to come in, we're only 2,848. And I did email Sam Taylor last year regarding this, and she said she'd work on it. But unfortunately, Sam Taylor is no longer with BC and has been replaced by somebody else whose name escapes me for the time being. So I think once I do the accounts fully, when I've got the final month's uh, figures in from management accounts, I'll revisit that and see if we can we can bottom it out. But ultimately, it's pretty good news from a financial perspective. You know, we've over £9,000 uh, in the bank. So with any luck, we'll be able to start uh, spending a bit more on grants, etc. in the next 12 months. And I think that's about all I can say, <laughs> realistically. Thank you, David. I don't know if anybody has any comments or questions. Well, Mike, can I say, I do hope we're going to approve these accounts, regardless of the situation in Lulworth. Yes. Mm, yes, things seem to be changing there almost by the month. Do we need, Dudley then, do we need to vote to a, a, on the yeah. accounts? Yes, yeah, we really, I, I'm, I think that normally I would, as treasurer, so David would propose the adoption, and I'm very happy to second. Okay. There we are. Well, the it's adoption. officially we proposed. Need, all, all the, this is the Just end of January. Ourselves. Okay. <laughs> so, can I ask those in favour to raise their hand, please? Thank you very much. Please, Robert, I'll say aye as well. I'm sorry, I missed that. I'm not on video, but I'm giving my approval. As oh, well. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, right. So, um, so we, we are in a healthy financial position, but we need, by the sound of things, to find some, uh, some project in which to uh, 
to invest. I see Aidan has his hand up. Aidan, what would you like to? Thank, thank you, Mike. I was just wondering whether we had any more bursaries in the offing, any more people we could uh, we could grant money to. Um, I think the, the, the um, sponsoring Pablo was, was reasonably successful. Is that something we, have we got anybody else in the queue? Uh, we don't have anybody uh, that I'm aware of at the moment. We continue to advertise it on the website. And I think I'm right in saying that in the past, either Nigel or Sam has mentioned it at um, BC head office, but obviously it's slightly more difficult to mention things at head office <laughs> when you're not there, but um, um, we will hopefully um, uh, uh, find somebody who's uh, interested. Oh, I see Nigel has his hand up. You're still muted at the moment, Nigel. Yeah, so you're not yeah, now. I've just found the button. Yeah, now I'll give it a good plug in the in the newsletter in a few weeks' time. The bursary scheme. I'll Thank give you it very a good much. Plug. Thank you. I, I just wondered, Sam, whether whether now that we have a lot more contacts in BCE, that uh, that we could that we could uh, find a find a, um, a, su a, su a suitable a suitable um, and uh, deserving candidate. We've got a lot more contacts now, haven't we, than we had say two years ago with all the new monitoring schemes coming on online. Yeah, yeah, we we could certainly plug that. I mean, uh, that's that shouldn't be an issue. Thanks, Sam. Um, we now need to uh, deal with um, re-elections. Sorry, sorry, Mike. Could I interrupt? Uh, Dan Danaher's got his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dan. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Could I just ask, I mean, uh, I was only saying yesterday on a Zoom with Sam that much of what we've been doing in Corfu Butterfly Conservation has been um, limited by funding issues over the last uh, couple of years. And so therefore, this conversation sounds very interesting from our perspective. <laughs> and um, could I just ask what is a protocol by which we might uh, investigate potential for funding? Well, I think, uh, Dan, you, you would probably need to uh, just um, probably start off by talking to me and then uh, emailing uh, what your particular requirements would be. And then we would certainly look at that as a as a committee and uh, uh, see what merit um, we think there is in it. But um, I'm sure we'd be happy to look at it. That's very kind. Thank you very much. So if there are no further hands up that I can see, but then I didn't see the last one, um, we need to deal with the election of, uh, re-election of, um, of committee members. So the BC rules are that one third of branch committee members are required to retire by seniority and they'll be ele eligible for re-election. Any members co-opted onto the committee also need to be uh, offer themselves to election at the following AGM. Uh, now, the members who are retiring by seniority are Dudley Cheeseman, Dave Plowman, Nick Greatrix Davis, and Martin Davis, who stand down by uh, re uh, by rotation and all seek re-election. Uh, now, Sam Ellis, who has been attending all of our committee meetings as the Butterfly Conservation Rep, uh, has announced that he is retiring from BC, I think from the end of May, I think. Uh, and I am delighted to say that Sam has accepted an invitation to join the committee. So I would like uh, please someone to pr propose the re-elections I mentioned and Sam's election to the committee. You can't... You, no, no, sorry. Can I just add something yeah. there, Mike? Yeah, just to say that um, I, as a member of staff, I can't sit on a committee while, while I'm still employed. So it wouldn't be 
until the end of May. Okay. Just, just to be clear. From the end of May. Yeah. Okay. So, um, if I could have uh, someone to um, propose the re-elections of Dudley Cheeseman, Dave Plowman, Nick Greatrich Davis, and Martin Davis. Thank you, Nigel. And a seconder. Nick Williams. Thank you. And those in favour, I'm hoping that I'll see lots of hands. Thank you very much. And could I um, seek a proposer for Sam's election to the committee from the end of May onwards? Thank I'm you, Dan. Happy to propose that, right? I'm happy to propose Sam's. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks. Yeah, I'm happy to propose Sam. And of course, there's nothing to stop Sam sitting in attendance before no. the end of May, as Indeed. he's been doing. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And a second, though, I think Dan had his hand up. So those in favour? Yes. Thank you all very much. So this really concludes the end of the formal business of the AGM. But before we pass over to Sam for his talk, are there any questions or any points that any member would like to make? Ah, Dan again. Sorry, <laughs> I do apologize. Um, <laughs> Sam, I just wanted to apologise to you because I didn't realise you were going to talk about this and I didn't know that I may have said some things that you prepared to say earlier on. So forgive me if I did that. Thank you. Right. Well, if there are no, I can't see anybody's hand up. So uh, thank you all very much. Our, our speaker, as we've said, is Sam Ellis, uh, currently International Director. Butterfly Conservation Chair of Butterfly Conservation Europe. So uh, an important man in so many ways. <laughs> now let's see, Sam, if I can uh, uh, allow you. Uh, share my, yeah. I think multiple par participants can share simultaneously. I think that that's, that should allow, allow you to share your screen. Aha. Uh -huh. Can you all see yeah. that? Yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks uh, for inviting me to to speak about my work, and apologies for keeping you away from uh, butterfly recording this afternoon. Uh, but uh, in in partial compensation, I've put some some photos, nice photos in. Well, I hope you think nice photos of a few European species. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna uh, this afternoon. I'm going to talk about uh, about the work that I've been doing over the last three years um, since April 2019, when um, I was asked to take on the part time role of international director to to promote more international conservation action. So um, I started that obviously, and uh, nine months after my appointment, we were then into COVID. So. Um, the sort of subtitle of my talk would be what I was able to do sitting from my desk in Dorset um, without actually going abroad anywhere or, or not very we, I think I had two trips abroad once with Mike to Madeira and I, I got to Laufen for a BC Europe meeting just as Covid was kicking off so um, anyway I, I'm going to talk about um, those those conservation projects that I've been involved with which I've been able to get started um, uh, over the last three years um, but the first thing I did was that we that we we recognized we didn't really have much a strategy within BC to to actually um, um, frame provide the framework for the, the work going forward so that was one of the, the, the first few months of my time was dedicated to producing that strategy and you'd be pleased to know I'm not going to talk through that in any detail uh, if I put up a, a, a one sentence to summarise the work that I was, I, I, uh, the actual strategy itself, it really was to build on the, the fantastic work that was already going on, uh, initiated by BC Europe and by um, EBG. Um, but outside Europe, I, was, I, I took the view that I should explore opportunities to build new partnerships uh, wherever those arose. So it was a good deal more opportunistic than um, the work beyond Europe. 
And I'll, I'll mention some of those things that I've been involved in uh, at the end of the talk. So um, the very first thing that I did was probably, in some ways, the most difficult. I, I thought it would be very simple to do, um, but and, and that was to do with um, helping EBG uh, um, to actually find a better mechanisms for um, sharing data and improving recording in Europe. Um, and this, this was prompted by a talk that in at the 2018 AGM by Chris Van Sway, who gave a talk on towards more effective butterfly conservation in Europe when he, he put forward ideas about how EBG could contribute more butterfly data, more recording data to, to European recording schemes. So Simon Spencer, once I got into post, Simon actually asked me to uh, start to look into this, how we could actually improve our recording efforts. And so I did talk to the committee members of EBG, uh, various other people about how we could improve that. Um, and the, the first thing I think was just to remind everybody that, that EBG already has a number of um, contacts with different countries and individuals uh, who receive records from EBG members. There are already these country specific spreadsheets developed by Simon. And part of the, the key thing, the key message was that where these exist, we would encourage people to, um, to use those for those countries. Um, the downside, of course, is that there are actually only 10 countries in Europe where we already have those spreadsheets and contacts um, to enable that to happen. So that was a bit of a limitation. So, so the, the big question is, OK, well, if, if you're recording outside of those countries, where, where do you go with your data? And um, that's so I, I took a step back and started looking at what exist in European recording schemes there are. So we are talking, not talking about monitoring here, we're just talking about uh, casual observations, sightings, records, whatever you want to call them. And I can't claim the, 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 the map on the left there is absolutely accurate, but I think it reasonably so. And that just shows where recording schemes do exist, where, where they are online, but not necessarily easily accessible if you're in a, dealing in a different language. Uh, there are recording schemes, the ones in light green, where, where uh, there isn't an online access to them. And there are quite a few countries in white there where there are no recording schemes. As I say, I can't be 100% certain that is right, but I, I roughly 50% of, Euro of European countries have recording schemes or just over 50%. So there are a lot of gaps. So the red dots there just show the countries EBG has contact with um, at, the, at the moment. So as I say, lots of gaps. So what, so what was the solution then? So, um, so what we came up with was really what Chris Van Sway had recommended, which is to adopt or suggest that you use an international recording platform. These are where you can submit records for anywhere on the planet and for any taxa, not just butterflies. So, and there are the two most obvious ones are the observation.org site, which is based in the Netherlands, and, and iNaturalist. These are the two schemes that I, I look, started to look at. Both of them have online uh, uh, data input, but you can also do them on, they, they both have apps which are available for both iPhone and Android phones as well. So the, the map I've, I've just been using, the lesser spotted fritillary here as an example, that's just a, a snapshot of records of that species ac across Europe. So it covers a number of countries, um, as you can see. So um, there's also on both those websites, there are specific portals developed by Butterfly Conservation Europe, um, which fo you just focus on the butterfly. So it's, you go straight to those if you want to input data. And so one of the things I worked with Chris Van Sway and others to produce was some guidance for both those two schemes. Um, and all of that is I, I put onto the, um, the EBG website uh, or it's downloadable from the EBG website. So just going to some, some quite a bit of detail how to, how to set that up and how to use them if you're in the field next year, for example. Um, and, and the other important thing is about these recording schemes is that they do 
share their data with the <laughs> GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Inf Information Facility. So that database is where other recording schemes could go and capture that data for their, so an individual recording scheme, say in Spain, for example, could uh, extract all the data they need from GBIF that's being submitted via these other recording schemes. So that, that's um, what I did first. The next thing that we looked at was, well, what about those people who've got thousands of records they've been collecting for years and years and years? How do we deal with that situation? And um, we, we decided that observation.org for various reasons was the best option for, uh, allow, for capturing that data. And my colleague, um, um, Les Evans Hill helped me with this. You won't be able to see the detail of this, don't worry about that. Uh, helped me develop a spreadsheet which would allow people to upload thousands of records if necessary to observation.org. And um, it's remarkably simple. Um, and I'll, ju I'll just, there, there's very little obligatory data that you need um, to actually input data, just a, an ID, a number, scientific name abundance, date, Latin longitude. You could include various optional data as well. And uh, this automated spreadsheet will validate the, the data that you input. So if the, I don't know if you can see my curse there, but you'll see the common name there. If the common name, you don't input the common name. If, you, it, it, if a common name appears there, it means that you've actually spelt the scientific name correctly in that, over there. There's a date validator and it also um, it also um, uh, converts your lat long into decimal lat longs. So this the idea of this is to upload all of your records. And I, I use myself as an example here. I've been collect. I don't do a massive amount of recording in Europe, but I, I've um, there's, I've got about thirteen or fourteen hundred records over the last fifteen years from various holidays, and it used to bother me that. It, it's sitting on my computer or in notebooks, you know, what if something happened to me, all that data potentially lost. So it's quite a relief to actually be able to upload that data somewhere to know it could be used in future. So anyway, I used all my data to test this method and make sure it works. Uh, the other thing that we did uh, cause the most debate really in Observado is, is which species are so sensitive that you wouldn't want that data to be shown on their website. And um, you can embargo, some data is embargoed automatically and you can actually embargo it yourself. Um, so we ended up with quite a short list of species that we were considered so sensitive that we would em em embargo the records. And there are uh, also data for things like uh, uh, scarce fertility. Um, which is embargoed in, in, in one or two countries, I think Italy and Germany, for example. So it's a relatively short, short list for embargoing. So what are the data that once you've uploaded your data to uh, Observado, it looks something like this. This is a selection of my data. Uh, there's a lot of automatic verification within Ob Observado. Um, so where records occur are a, a similar geographic location to other records that have been verified, they get a grey tick. You can see in that column there. Um, the green ticks are where I've submitted photographs to justify my uh, decision on what species I saw. And, and you, you can see that below there, some, these are species that I saw in 2019 in France and uh, I submitted the photograph and, and the automated, automatic ticks there will, will uh, verify those dates, data points. So I think we've got a mechanism there that, w that is a very simple way of uploading large historical data sets. What I can't tell you is how much this has been used because I can't access all the other people's records easily in, in Observado um, to check whether we've got new members, uh, EBG members, uh, uh, going, putting their data on there. All I would say is I'd encourage everybody in EBG to think about it. If you don't put your data anywhere, this is one simple way of, of, of making sure it, it goes into a recording scheme. Um, and, and I think you know, it's then available for others to, to, to see and use. 
And so all, all this information, how to use this is all on the uh, EBG website. I think it's under species and it includes links to the websites and apps. So that was quite a big piece of work, actually. It quite, took quite a lot of time to develop that, uh, surprisingly. So uh, Mike's already mentioned uh, when we turn to monitoring, uh, the EB, European Butterfly Monitoring Scheme is well established in Europe. And, and uh, you'll see the map looks very similar to the record, recording schemes map, you know, gaps in, in Eastern and Southern Europe, um, but they're gradually being filled. Um, and you see dark green there are all the EU, EU countries with BMS data, light green are the ones that were established through the ABLE project Mike mentioned, and the grey ones are the, the ones which the new spring project is, is um, trying to establish new schemes, so places like Denmark, uh, Greece, Slovakia, still without a scheme. So. That's, that project is ongoing. It will run for the rest of this year and I think into early into next year. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively short project, but um, um, hopefully that we will then have complete coverage at least of the EU. And why is that important? Well, it's really the, the, the value is in the development of the indicators which, in, which help inform policy work at EU level. And I'm sure you've seen these before, but... Uh, um, Butterfly Conservation Europe developed these grassland indicators, both in the EU 27 and, and across Europe, uh, showing decline of around 20% of grassland species. Um, uh, the, the, most recently, there's enough now data to actually develop indicators for other habitats. I've just used woodland here as an example. And, and as you can see, that, that shows actually a decline bottoming out and actually numbers starting to increase. Which you know we're not 100% sure what that what that reason for that, but it could be uh, it could be climate change making woodlands more suitable. Uh, it could be uh, abandonment, increasing amount of woodland cover. We're not really sure, but that's what they. The, I, I guess the really the, the key thing I wanted to flag up to you um, that came out of Able and Mike's already mentioned this is the butterfly count app, and uh, um, as Mike said, we tech we tested this out in in Madeira and it's well I think it's brilliant it, it, I think it's a real important halfway house between traditional recording like we've talked about through Observada and standard monitoring through transect counts it's certainly not a replacement for transect counts by any means but it is a way of actually uh, providing more data in those out of the way places that haven't got transects for example um, you can download the Butterfly Count app onto your Apple and Android phones. There are, it's in 16 different languages. There are um, uh, country guides for, I think, 48 countries now. That includes some, some islands. And within each um, of those uh, guides, you, you, you can see it lists the species which occur in that country. And gives a, a brief overview of, of that the, the species. It doesn't go into identification as such, but it just gives a, a brief summary of the species. And you need to register an account on the European Butterfly Monitoring Scheme to, to use this. But um, um, as I say, I used it with Mike in Madeira, and um, it, I'll just give you show, just show you very quickly how it works. But essentially, it's an app on your phone, um, you click where it says duration and the, the clock starts ticking and you can start recording. Importantly, you can stop the clock. If you need to stop to identify species, take a photograph or whatever, you, you can stop that clock and then start it again once you've done that identification or taken that photograph. So um, you then have to type in the species, you click add species, you just type in the first two letters of the species name, whether in, um, in, in uh, its scientific name or common name, and it will give you a drop down list of species and you can click on the relevant one. And um, it will then uh, bring up the species and where it says count there, the one will appear. And subsequently, all you need to do it the next clouded yellow you see, you just click on that number again and it keeps adding them on. 
And eventually you get to the end of your 15 minutes and uh, the count will then stop. I know there's been a bit of debate in, in uh, EBG about how useful this bike might be. I could see potentially it might be difficult where you've got hundreds of individuals and many, many species, but it certainly worked very effectively in, uh, in Madeira for us where there is a relatively short species list. Um, and uh, most importantly, I think if you look at, you can do a, a 15 minute count either sitting in your deck chair so a bit like a big butterfly count, uh, you know, in, in your garden without moving, or you can do it by walking a random route through an area, which is what we did in Madeira. And the, 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 the slide, the um, image on the right here shows the individuals that were recorded in one of Mike and I's 15 minute counts. Each of those blobs represents one of the species. So the exact location is given for each individual butterfly that you record. So that's when I mean it's a bit of a halfway house between monitoring and recording. You can use this to record butterflies in, in a very simple way, as well as contributing to the data analysis that the European Butterfly Monitoring Scheme will, will do. Um, more, and you can then uh, download that data from the, um, the EBMS website. Well, it's uploaded to the EBMS, EBMS website, but you can, you can uh, check your records, edit them, and you can share that data with a recording scheme if you so desire. So, as I say, I'm quite keen on this um, as, a, as a method. I'd certainly, if you're out in Europe this summer, I'd certainly recommend having a, having a, having a play with it. I, as we used it in Madeira, I, I'm joining Dan in, in Corfu in the beginning of May, and I'll certainly be giving it a go there again. Okay, so uh, what's, all our, what's all this recording monitoring data used for? Well, um, one of the most obvious things is to identify threats to species, um, not just butterflies, but moths too. And one of the projects that I'm really pleased to say is actually happening is is to develop um, a European moth red list for the first time and these this has been led by IUCN. BC is a partner uh, some of you might have heard of my colleagues Mark Parsons and, and Phil Sterling um, they they're both doing that work for butterfly conservation we're also working with Dutch butterfly conservation Chris Van Sway is uh, taking the lead there um, uh, the project is funded by the EU. And as I'm sure you're fully aware, the, the, the purpose of a red list is to identify those species most at risk of extinction, in particular those three threatened categories, critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. Um, so we are doing, I, I'm not d directly involved in this project now, but ba basically there will be two types of assessment there's one which covers, and you might not be able to see that, that graph terribly well, but the map very well, but uh, it covers the EU 27 countries and as a separate assessment for the whole of Europe. So there are always two levels of assessment in these. Um, there's about 8,000 moth species in Europe. To do assessments on all of those would be a massive task. I mean, it's already going to be a massive task simply doing to over 3,000 macro moths. Um, and the, the reason for choosing macro moths is simply be, because there's more data available for them than, than there are for micro moths. There isn't a lot in the way of population data. Most of the, the effort will be looking at distribution data. And for the period 2010 to 2020, I think is the, the span of we're looking at. Um, it's quite a big project. Uh, IUCN take a rather large chunk of the money of it. Uh, Dutch BC are taking a big chunk as well because they're doing a lot of the, uh, the data analysis, data gathering, data analysis. And uh, my colleagues will be doing some of the writing of the assessments. And that should be available at the end of March 2024. Um, you'll be aware that um, we, there already is a European red list of butterflies. That, that was produced in 2010. Um, led by Chris 
Chris Van Swave and, and EBG had quite a, quite an input into that. I I, I know. The IUCN and the EU are in planning to revise existing red lists of 11 different taxa, including the butterflies. Uh, there's a smaller budget for doing this project because it is a revision of a 92,000 euros. BC's got 35,000 to do that. And that 18 month project will be completed in September, 2023. Um, the, Chris Van Sway is involved in this one. He's leading on the data analysis. Um, uh, Chris, uh, Martin Warren and I are doing the uh, uh, writing of the assessments, um, uh, much of which is rather mundane, I have to say, because it is simply checking existing work. There will be, uh, last time in the red list, there was um, uh, a meet, in person meeting to review the assessments, particularly for those threatened species which were. Uh, well, the, whether they were threatened or not, or whether they were near threatened, were, their, their exact status required some discussion. That was um, undertaken by an in-person meeting. Unfortunately, there isn't the resource to do that, but there will be online meetings. And Martin and I will be in touch with the, the EBG committee to um, in, involve them in that process. So we will be very keen to hear your views. Uh, and of course, if you contribute data through your recording, um, that, that, that'll be utilized as well. So in the data sharing, the, the, uh, the data that we're gonna use for the red list mainly comes from Observado, iNaturalist and GBIF uh, because that's the most comprehensive data sets that are available. And as I say, the data period is 2010 to 20. For um, Clouded Apollo, we've already built well, for all the, the, the uh, European butterflies, we now have some new distribution maps based on those three data sources. There's obviously a lot of checking to be done in there, but um, um, they, they enables us to do that assessment. Um, and Chris, Chris Van Sway has already done some of these assessments. You can see for the, the uh, solid red line there, or the bold red line, showing the trend for clouded Apollo. Uh, which suggests this species is not in decline and, and not threatened from that assessment. Um, we've um, done, uh, just to show you another one for high brown fertility. Um, there's the distribution, um, distribution map. Um, we've got some uh, data analysis that Chris has done. Sorry, it's slightly confusing there, but there are the green and the blue lines show the population trends at the EU and uh, across Europe. So overall abundance doesn't seem to be declining, but uh, the, dust, the, the red line suggests that there is a, distri a distribution decline in Europe. So that's the kind of work that we're doing. We'll be analyzing these, these trends across the continent. Um, and I can tell you the, one, the, the interesting thing, I haven't got a slide, a slide of it here, but uh, one of the species that's actually, that actually seems to be in the biggest decline is small tortoise shell. Abundance of that is is around about sixty seven percent, I think, over the last decade. Um, that could well be one of the head, sort of headline uh, results of, for, from this project. Um, obviously, there's a bit of data checking to be done for that yet, but that does appear to be the case. So that's the red list projects that I've been involved in, um, and within. The, these red lists, those of you uh, probably have, there's always some debate about whether the Macronesian islands are part of Europe or not. I know in some people, for you, it's not, and some it is, but for purposes of red list, it is considered part of Europe. And um, as you know, they are a hotspot for endemics on the continent. Um, so there, um, we have been undertaking a project in the last year, well, last few months, for that last six months really, um, to look at three of the most endangered butterflies um, on the continent. That's the Madeira and Large White, the Madeira and Brimstone, and the Madeira and Speckled Wood, and all of which are endemics on Madeira. Um, we worked with Madeira Flora and Fauna, um, uh, an outfit on, on, on the island, Butterfly Conservation Europe led the application, Life for Best provided the funding, and we secured about um, 40,000 euros to do this project. And the idea was to survey laurel forests for these three species, 
identify key habitat areas for protection, build monitoring capacity, um, in particular trying to get um, uh, transex established, which will be run by the local stakeholders, and establish a butterfly monitoring scheme for the island. And obviously there's awareness raising, and we were gonna produce three action plans for the three target species. Um, so there's our chair, um, uh, Mike Prentice there with, with Sergio Texera from um, uh, Madeira Flora and Fauna, uh, discussing our work um, out on the island in September. And as he mentioned, or Mike mentioned already, we did a massive amount of survey work. The red lines on that map just show the survey routes that we, uh, we surveyed over a relatively short period of few months. So probably Madeira is as well surveyed as it's ever been. Um, there were 18 people participated in the survey. We did 41 days of survey. We, we walked over 500 kilometers of survey route across 49 sites, recorded over 10,000 butterflies of 14 species. So as I say, pretty well recorded, I think. Uh, not one of those species was the Madeira and large white. It does look like that species has gone extinct. It hasn't been seen since 1986. Um, there's still, I suppose there's still a possibility that it may be picked up on some of the remoter areas. We are using uh, drones to do some further survey work uh, this year on the island. But I, I, my gut feeling, I think everybody else's gut feeling, is unfortunately that, that it has become extinct. Uh, but the other target species were the Madeira and brimstone. Uh, that was the rarest species. Uh, we only had 100, over 100 individuals on a third of the survey routes. This Madeira and speckled wood um, uh, was found on 80% of the survey routes. We also surveyed for the other endemic Madeira and grayling. Um, that was mainly co confined to mountain heathlands. Um, the speckled wood, Madeira and speckled wood was actually found both in the, the um, the na native laurel forest, but also some forested areas as well. Whereas the Madeira and brimstone tend to be confined to the laurel forest only. The other species we recorded a lot was, was Ageria, the speckled wood, because that's re a recent uh, colonist of the island. We don't really know how much impact it's having on Ziphia at this point in time. What we can say is that pretty much everywhere Ziphia was found, so was Ageria, uh, as that map shows you might not be able to pick up the detail there but uh, the ziphia dot the yellow dots are ziphia and ageria are, are the blue dots you can say pretty much i think pretty much everywhere um, they were found so there's uh, quite a bit of work to, analysis to do on this of this data but we're very pleased that the project has been so successful to date um, the reason why the madeira brimstone is so rare is because its host plant is pretty rare um, this is uh, a ramna species, um, uh, glandulosa. It's called that because of these glands on the leaf, highlighted there in red. Um, the tree itself is extremely rare, and we recorded everywhere that it was found. That's those yellow dots on the map there. Um, um, at pr at pretty scarce across the island, although there were some uh, mm -hmm. concentrations of, of, of the, the food plant, but pretty difficult to find. So one of the outcomes of this project will be a conservation action plan and a very simple action will be to persuade people to collect seeds and to, to um, grow on saplings for this tree to a host plant to be planted out in suitable locations. There's one here that conveniently outside a very pleasant bar in Ribeira Frio, the, the hot spot that uh, is, is shown here. So yeah, that's a, hopefully that project will really deliver something quite important for, for you know, some of Europe's most threatened species. Right, okay, here's Dan. <laughs> so Dan, we've all, I, I can, I've just got two slides here um, to mention Corfu um, Butterfly Conservation, which I've been working with Dan for over the last couple of years. Um, he's already mentioned that he's gonna, the, the objective is to produce an atlas. Um, they've got a fantastic website to submit their records. If you've not looked at that, I would uh, you know, really suggest that you do if you get the opportunity. And as Dan said, it's now, Coal Food Butterfly Conservation is now a community interest group in its own right. Um, we really hope um, 
the atlas will eventually be produced. Um, it's interesting that uh, you know, the idea originally was to coincide with the centenary of, of Gerald Durrell's birth. And his widow, Lee Durrell, you might have heard of, is part of the, the group. It's not just British people going out to Corfu to do recording. Dan has built some very strong relationships with the local people who obviously will hopefully um, you know, develop th their recording skills. OK. Yeah, so uh, the other thing, yeah, Dan men mentioned the... Um, the identification guide, you mentioned the poster, but we've also worked with him to produce the identification guide for Corfu. This is in the same format as the European Butterfly Monitoring Scheme uh, ID guides that Mike mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, I think these are pretty good. I mean, it's, um, uh, they're not quite as detailed as some of the guides uh, that, 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 that we have um, on the EBG website, but you know, they're designed for a wide audience to use. So there's little in the way of technical jargon. Um, so, but anyway, I think they're very good. I'm very pleased with them. Right, okay, so I've just got a few slides to finish off with, but um, I just wanted to flag a few things outside of Europe um, that I got involved with. And again, this has been largely opportunistic. I met Karen Agabavion uh, in the, the center of that slide there uh, from Armenia it, at, um, uh, at an EBMS meeting and we got chatting. He was keen to establish um, a butterfly monitoring scheme in Armenia and in Georgia. So we put together a project with the idea of seeking funding from um, the Darwin Initiative. Uh, unfortunately, we've, we haven't secured that, uh, but that project is still ready to go. Um, we would hope to develop it over the next year or two if possible. Uh, it's amazing. Well, I've not been to Armenia, but it's got a heck of a lot of butterflies, uh, about four times as what we got in the UK and about the eighth of the land area. So um, it would be a fantastic addition to the European Butterfly Monitoring Scheme. And for that purposes, we, we are fairly loose in our definitions of what constitutes Europe. Further afield, I also was contacted by some people in the Kahima Institute of India. Uh, in, in Nagaland, who were keen on developing a recording project, an education project over there. Um, and we've had several meetings also trying to secure funding from the DAO initiative, but not successful as yet. Um, there's a, in Nagaland, there's over a thousand butterfly species, but apparently about 100 of them are common and easy to ID. And the idea would be to do this, um, a community-based recording project. You, um, in eco schools. So in other words, a, a munching caterpillar is India. Um, again, that I think we're gonna reapply for funding that later this year. Going completely global, the other project that I've spent a lot of time on is the idea of a global butterfly index. As, as you know, most population data analysis is, the, well, the most important one is the living planet index and um, uh, but that is pretty much based on vertebrate data. And we have an ambition to try and incorporate invertebrate data into that. So that was the, the, the rationale for trying to build a global butterfly index. Um, so I and a number of colleagues uh, from the IUCN Butterfly Specialist Group, now the Butterfly Moth Specialist Group, got together with ZSL, uh, who'd already been working on this, this idea. Um, BC, Dutch BC, UK CEH and BC Europe to, to um, try and explore the idea of trying to build a global butterfly index. ZSL have already been trying to gather data from various sources as that map shows. It's not comprehensive, but uh, they've collected data from schemes. We want to try and collect data from a, right across as many countries as possible to create this global index. Um, and to do that, we need to develop relationships with NGOs and individuals that are running butterfly monitoring schemes. We're planning on a global butterfly monitoring conference, um, possibly next year, um, to try and build momentum for the project. Um, but we want to build working relationships with those NGOs and individuals so we can data share. And then the next three points are about actually developing a system to allow data sharing 
uh, and to do the analysis which will provide the trends for from the data and that's where UKCEH come in we think European butterfly monitoring scheme might be the best tool could be adapted to incorporate data from pretty much um, anywhere and obviously the ultimate game is to promote um, the project outputs to do more advocacy work so that project we we are, are um, I have to say we've we've done a lot of thinking about this but we are struggling for funding and um, certainly the, the one of my replacement um, for when, when I retire a key part of their work will be building this global um, global butterfly index project um, and last uh, literally the last couple of slides um, the other thing that I've been working on is is how, you know to what extent can we influence management land management in Europe uh, we know we're pretty good at this in the UK we we have a fantastic array of um, fact sheets on individual species management uh, for habitats like woodlands grasslands and so on we, we we're pretty good at this in the in, in BC but if you go on the continent it's there's not a lot available and one of my ideas is to try and uh, uh, try and develop that much better so I've been putting together a, a library of uh, relevant papers on European butterflies there are about uh, I've already got over 1450 which relate in some ways to management of species um, that but th that's oh, there are only 100 species that I've found so far that have had ecological research most of those are from, as you'd expect, from Northwest Europe, incl including all our species in the UK. Um, the, so it's an Atlantic, Boreal and, and um, continental biogeographic regions where most of the effort research has been done. You can also find lots of papers on but so butterfly assemblages, um, particularly grassland and especially calcareous, but also farmland and woodland. So we've got this is this is part of um, a big project. It needs funding. We've got an application at the minute, and the idea would be to try and produce some sort of land management advisory hub to 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 share knowledge how to manage habitats most effectively for conservation. I think that might be it. Yeah. Okay. So that is the end of my talk. I hope I won't talk too long. Um, I hope. I mean. I think. This, just to summarise, well, I think we're making pretty good um, progress in Europe uh, with limited resources as ever, and, and also not being able to travel um, has been a difficult, uh, difficult few years. But anyway, thanks for your interest. Thanks for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Really interesting. Thanks. Uh, do we have any... Uh... Any questions from anybody, if you'd like to? Ah, oh, yes, Nigel, Nigel Peace. Hi. Uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, on, the, um, on the butterfly count app that you've tested uh, in, uh, in Madeira, um, how do you record location? It's done all, it's automatically, it's us using the, the, the inbuilt GPS of the phone. It's, uh, so so do you have to sort of set it up no, to no, get it going? No, no. It, honestly, it's really, really easy. You just download it and, and li you literally start it. And it, it, it will, as long as, as long as you know, there's the you, you the, your phone, your phone's location is switched on. It will use that. And do, do you need a good reception or? or... Well, we we never had any problems on Madeira. I don't know whether anybody else has elsewhere i'm not aware of it but so far it's all been fine i think and it'll give the location of each individual species that each, you're, each, you're entering each individual butterfly you record every one it's quite amazing really it's, um, mm. yeah yeah thank you yeah do we have any other questions for sam I mean, I don't know what you've been doing, Sam, all these years. You know. <laughs> uh, don't forget, I only work two days a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, supposedly, it's, <laughs> it's been amazing. You've yeah. done, you've done an awful lot and put in a lot of energy in the in the time you've been there. I think Martin Davis has put his hand up. Um, Sam, the the distribution maps that you just showed uh, that are being used to help inform the red data list yeah. uh, assessment. 
Um, I just wanted to be clear what they are based on. You, you mentioned Observado and iNaturalist. Yeah. Is, is it solely that, or are they building on other bases like yeah. the, um, the German systems? No, right. The, the, at the minute, that the ones that Chris has produced are based solely on Observado and iNaturalist and GBIF. So there are three sources. It, it, when you do red lists, I, I, I've only just done the sort of training to do these, and and you know what's apparent is that for, for what you need, the data that you need, you don't have to get. Uh, uh, sorry for the the analysis that's undertaken. So it's basically the extent of occurrence across the the the, the region and and the um, uh, the individual the individual squares themselves. So the area of occupancy, if you like. You don't need to have data from every single recording scheme. It's good if you can, but for the, the, the purposes of the initial analysis, particularly for the species which are, are all are going to be least concerned, that we're not going to be worried about, you probably don't need any more. Um, the, we may be having more discussions about that as the project develops, but I know, I know for example, in the Moth one, uh, the Moth project, we had, there wasn't much in the way of, from the UK in those three sources when they did the moth one. So we got permission from Richard Fox and, and Nigel to, um, to make sure we could get access to the Tetrad data from, from, from that source. So there isn't a strict yes or no to your question, Martin, but um, uh, yeah, I take your point. I mean, the German stuff is good, isn't it? It's, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Simon, so wouldn't, um, wouldn't that actually be in GBIF? Doesn't Lepidiv go up to GBIF? I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. It, if it does, it'll have been. We'll have act, we'll have got access to it. it may well be. I, I couldn't tell you exactly. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of different data sets in GBIF. I couldn't tell you yeah. exactly which are in and which are out. I think I think the um, UFZ Lepido stuff goes into GBIF. I'm not certain, but I, I'm pretty certain. Yeah. If I could just ask one supplementary. The um, and did I understand correctly on on the red list? They're using definition of Europe as it was used in the 2010 yes. red list they're not they're not in any way adapting the boundaries or anything no uh, no it's, I think it's exactly the same uh, as that yeah and the and then obviously there's EU 20 used to be more <laughs> EU it's EU 27 as well so there are going to be two different assessments so you get two results for each species right yeah Okay. Right, can I ask a question, please? Of course. Sam, do we have any better idea of who is going to continue your work within BC? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can. Yes, yes. So the, the things since we last talked, uh, things have moved on a bit. So uh, I think at, at the last committee meeting, I, I said I was going to be replaced in some way, but I didn't know how. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, well, I, I, so I can tell you that they're, they're now replacing my post with one uh, with actually more time. It's actually going to be a four day, four day week post, whereas I'm working two and a, a little bit. So they're actually, but but at a lower grade. So they're making the money that they used to spend on me to go further. So uh, uh, so that there's a current application live for um, that post. I think at the minute. So we'll see who we get. Uh, coming forward to that um, but so and and obviously they will pick up some of the work that I'm already doing um, and obviously so for example they, they will be the link with uh, EBG yeah um, they're going to provide that person will provide some secretarial support for uh, BC Europe uh, and I can let, I can tell you uh, Nigel Bourne is going to take my place well, my, Nigel Bourne will be representing B, BC on the BC Europe board uh, because I can't do that once I stop being an employee. Yeah. I've, I've agreed to stay on the board and, uh, well, yeah, I can stay on the board indefinitely at the minute, uh, but I, I will stay as chair for the time being until somebody uh, volunteers or is... <laughs> Or it's the worst into taking on that role, but I said I'll do that till uh, the end of the year to make sure there's no no uh, um, no upset in and in, in the process. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, in a, in a, at the time, I was quite worried that that maybe you know if, if if my time my my post wasn't replaced, but it looks like it's all 
similar amount of money's going going into it, if if not a little bit more time, really. It's, um, so that's quite pleasing. Okay. And as I say, the key focus will be for that person uh, will be that global butterfly index project is the, the one that key, BC. Thank key. you. Do we have any more questions? I can't see any hands. No. So thank you once again, Sam. Thanks for not only the talk, which is really fascinating, but also the work you've done over the last two and a half years. I think uh, it's been fantastic to have you uh, being as energetic uh, on behalf of European butterflies. So thank you very much. Well, can and I just say, can I just say, it's been a great pleasure to work with you and, and all the others on the committee. I've um, I've actually learned a tremendous amount myself working with you. So that's been, uh, it, it works both ways. <laughs> Good, thank you. So unless any, oh, sorry, I see Aidan has his hand up. No, sorry, that was just that was just the clapping symbol, but it seems to have thrown. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, it's most appropriate to give Sam a clap, but uh, thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, thank you all for attending. Um, I really sincerely hope, and I've said this before, and I know I sound a bit like a crack record, but I sincerely hope that next time we will be able to meet beforehand in the pub and afterwards in the pub and yeah. uh, have a yeah. meeting in person. But uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.